Welcome to the first session of uh, this year's Chatham House IEU Forum. And it's all about international cooperation to end IUU fishing. And as Peter Thompson just mentioned there, there's a powerful suite of tools available and we just need to implement them properly. We should encourage transparency and cooperation is key. And that's actually the theme of uh, this first session. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Peter Horn. I am working at the Pew Charitable Trusts and I head up the ending illegal fishing element of our international fisheries program. And I've been asked to uh, moderate the, uh, the session today. And what we'll have is uh, four expert panelists uh, presenting four short presentations, and then we'll go into a uh, question and answer session. In the main, I'll be uh, posing the questions on your behalf. And so please use the question and answer um, box, which is uh, in the Zoom there, for you to set the questions. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the instructions which Chatham House pushed out in advance, saying, please read the questions of uh, other people, and you can give them a thumbs up if you like them. Um, and if you'd like to actually place a question in person, we may, uh, as, the, uh, as the session goes on, call on people to do that. Please could you put on that, uh, put on the question that you're going to be asking uh, in the Q&A uh, chat and also let me know that you've uh, raised your hand to, to make your point. And I see this as a real opportunity because quite often, I'm sure, no doubt like me, you've been to countless um, forum and meetings before where people sometimes just keep on asking the same question and people make a statement rather than actually asking a question. And this is an opportunity for us actually to ask these questions of the panelists. And so this is really uh, quite exciting for me. I also just like to highlight uh, what Tim said before, and that's the fact that it is not Chatham House rules. Uh, this is live stream, so it is on the record. Now the premise for this session is that inter international cooperation is critical for combating IEU fishing. And I'm sure most of you would agree with that. But here we are in 2020, and as Peter Thompson highlighted, the SDG target is clearly not going to be met. Why? And can we ever expect to meet that goal? And so today we're going to be exploring a little bit of the, the role that international cooperation plays in combating IEU fishing. And what, what progress has been made in implementing key agreements like the Port State Measures Agreement, what are the challenges, what are the next steps, what are the types of international partnerships that are needed to combat IUU as we look to head towards a global recession, resource is going to be even more important than ever and so how can we strengthen international cooperation. So I'm really delighted to be moderating this panel and I'd just like to uh, take a couple of minutes to introduce you to the the four panelists before I call on the, the first one to speak. Hopefully we're gonna have a great discussion. We start off with Matthew Camillari, who is uh, head of fishing operations uh, and the technology branch at the UNFAO. Dr. Camillari has been um, involved in fishing for a long, long time. And uh, before joining the FAO in 2007, is very prominent in Malta. Critically for today, Matthew serves as the technical secretary to the meetings of the parties of the 2009 FAO agreement on port state measures, which Peter Thompson referred to repeatedly. And he leads the capacity development program for the implementation of that agreement. Next, we have Roberta Cesari, who's the head of the EU IUU Fisheries Policy Unit. Roberto is... Uh, has about 25, 26 years experience in fisheries management. And his team, and he and his team, look just both at the internal part of the, uh, the EU IEU regulation, so the EU CAC certification schemes, and externally, of course, he's very closely involved in the IUU uh, dialogues with third countries. We often refer to it as carding. Third, we have Bronwyn Gulder, who is a fellow at the uh, Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions. Bron has got a, uh, a wide experience, both at WWF and Pew, and before that, she uh, in uh, risk management for a, a bank. And Bron is going to be talking a little bit 
about how heads of state, how we can generate the political will to actually implement some of these agreements. And then the last speaker that we'll have today is Emily Langley, who is Acting Director for Ocean Go Governance at the Nature, Nature Conservancy. Very closely involved in a lot of uh, work on countering IUU. She uh, has got IUU projects running in Japan, China, the Pacific and Latin America. Also quite interesting for me, uh, she's a member of the High Seas Alliance. And so looking at the new treaties and new in international instruments, which are coming in. You had quite enough of me speaking. So now I'd like to call on uh, Matthew to uh, please give us our first presentation of this afternoon. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's, it's a great honor for me to be addressing you this afternoon. And I thank Chatham House for being able to put this event together despite the circumstances. International cooperation to end IU fishing. I think that this is a very important start to this, uh, to this week's cooperation. Well, we know that there's been a suite of international instruments that have been developed and adopted throughout the years, ever since the adoption of the UN Law of the Sea Convention. And this is really the foundation of international cooperation, where states come together and agree on minimum international standards that need to be applied. And flag port, coastal and market state responsibilities have been clearly defined. Of course, these instruments continue to develop. The instruments need to be implemented and they need to be reviewed and supplemented with any other new instruments that may be required. But apart from the adoption of these international instruments and measures, one can look at international cooperation also at regional level, which is very crucial, at regional, sub-regional, bilateral, and RFMOs, regional fishery management organizations, and other agents are in place, and these organizations implement the minimum international standards that have been set at global level, but also the states belonging to these RFMOs come together to agree on some a set of regional standards, perhaps more stringent and applicable to the region. Information exchange and transparency. To combat IU fishing, information exchange among states, amongst organizations is crucial. Information needs to be exchanged in a structured and effective way, but not only shared, but be available in a timely manner. And for states to be able to take appropriate action based on the best information that would be available. Capacity development in partnership. This is crucial. Not all states are at the same level and have the capacity to implement their mi minimum responsibilities. And therefore capacity development is important. We do have some very um, successful stories, uh, successful examples that have taken place in capacity development. For a start, FAO is very um, fortunate to have a very well-established capacity development program at global level, supported by numerous donors and also partners for the benefit of the developing states to improve their capacity. We also have another example, the Jeff funded uh, FAO implemented ABNJ program, where through the, the TUNA project, we've had tremendous RFMO cooperation, which led to replicating successful experiences from one region to another and the creation of the TUA TUNA compliance network. It is important for states to cooperate in trade to apply WTO compatible trade measures to ensure that there is no trade going on with um, IUU fishing derived fish. It's also uh, very effective to have joint enforcement schemes. These enforcement schemes 
are applied by a number of RFMOs and also on a bilateral basis. And there needs to be cooperation in taking effective action among states, for example, between port and flag states. So what is the status of the implementation of the international agreements? And what are the key challenges and next steps? Well, we have heard from the ambassador that we've got um, a measure of the status of implementation of the most relevant international instruments. And that lies in the SDG indicator 1461. In 2018, we have measured that out of a maximum level of implementation of five, at global level, this level is three, it's three out of five. So there is still room for improvement, but um, the ambassador uh, expressed his, his uh, optimism that this could be um, achieved in the near future. Just focusing a bit on the Port State Measures Agreement, the most recent binding agreement specifically adopted to target and combat IU fishing. Well, from this chart, you can see that, um, I'm not sure whether, from this chart, you can see that the Port State Measures Agreement, the rate of adherence to the Port State Measures Agreement in its first 10 years um, since adoption is far greater than it, it, that for other international instruments, including the Law of the Sea, the Compliance Agreement, Fistox Agreement, uh, et cetera. Since uh, it's coming into force, the rate of adherence has continued to increase. And currently there are 66 parties to the agreement and that includes the European Union and all its member states. So as you can see from this map, the, uh, the, the globe is actually being covered by states which are compliant or trying to comply with the minimum standards required by the Port State Measures Agreement. The parties came together, they've held a number of meetings, it's now, they've got a, a plan, they've got rules of procedure on how to conduct the meetings, and their focus is now really uh, on the information exchange that is very much fundamental to the implementation of the Port State Measures Agreement. They also have a part six working group addressing the needs of developing states uh, that meets from, from time to time, and in support of this, um, of the Article 21 to support developing states, FAO has this global program in place that I mentioned earlier that is supporting up to 40 countries around the world. What are the key challenges? If I were to just name a few, the most important ones, stronger political will, not only to adhere to international instruments, but to implement and commitment to keep that in a sustainable manner. The implementation of what the international instruments say, implementation of what RFMOs uh, establish and enforcement of those minimum measures and regulations. And capacity development continues to remain um, very, very much uh, something that needs to be addressed from the legal institution and operational angles. Interagency coordination, it is important that it's not only the fisheries agencies that are acting, but the fisheries agencies in cooperation with the transport agencies, customs, environment, etc. All those that have any way, some connection with um, fishing vessels. Of course, COVID-19 impacts on uh, monitoring control, surveillance markets, economic development, political dynamics and priorities have added to the challenges in combating IUU fishing, and therefore this is another variable that needs to be addressed. The next critical steps, the development of the Port State Measures Agreement Global Information Exchange System, the need to have international standards for the regulation, control and monitoring of transshipment practices. Transshipment is required for the profitability of some fisheries, but if transshipment is not regulated and controlled, this may be an avenue for one to be able to launder fish. So therefore, transshipment practices need to have more of an international standard for their regulation control and monitoring. And strengthen information sharing networks and cooperation. There are a number of information um, systems and schemes around the world developed by RFMOs and other entities, but it's important for these to be linked up together. Finally, the last section of my introduction today, 
is strengthening of international partnerships to combat IUU fishing. So what do we need to strengthen in partnership? We know that there's a lot of cooperation around the world, but we need to have more joint programs between intergovernmental organizations, FAO, IMO, ILO and UNODC, so that we can not only tackle IU fishing, but also address the safety, working conditions, and crimes that are taking place within the fishing sector. We need to strengthen the RFMO's contribution to effective and monitored implementation of international, instrument, of international instruments and the minimum requirements that are contained in there. We need to take advantage of the good information that is collected through RFMO information systems and link that regional information to global information systems. We also need to have more coordinated delivery of capacity development support by IGOs, NGOs, states and donors so that we can maximize the benefits that are received by the, by the developing states in improving their capacity. And finally, the development and implementation of regional multilateral bilateral plans of action to combat IU fishing. It's important for more states to come together either bilaterally or multilaterally or broader, because it is only through concerted action that combating IU fishing will be achieved. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I think that to summarize what I think that international uh, cooperation is, well, I think it is best explained in short by the title of one of the greatest songs that have ever been written. I think that international cooperation in this context is a bridge. It is a bridge over troubled water. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Matthew. And I'm sure that we will be coming back to some of those themes as we uh, as we go uh, as we come back into questions on information exchange, uh, capacity development, and how to strengthen partnerships and how to look at things in a through, through a regional. Uh, perspective. So that was super. Thank you very much. Uh, Roberto, um, I'll now be asking you to uh, come on and do your presentation, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter, and thanks to Chatham House uh, for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to address uh, you and the colleagues uh, and to be here with all of you. Uh, the presentation is not going to be long, and I thank very much Anne and Chatham House for their assistance. But what I would like to focus on, uh, talking about international cooperation, uh, it's uh, uh, the experience that we have been maturing in the EU, and in particular in the European Commission with my team uh, on the practical side, uh, uh, and share with you uh, our real life uh, experience and work during these last years. That's the reason why you see this title uh, on the first slide. So we can move on the, to the second one, please, Anna. So Matthew already explained uh, uh, very much what's the uh, entire legal framework we're working in. Here, uh, uh, we're all uh, obviously convinced uh, uh, because of the nature of the uh, problem IUU, how much it's fundamental, uh, the international cooperation. What I would like to, to seek with this uh, first slide is to describe a bit uh, what are the bodies uh, and the environment uh, we're working in on the practical side, as I said, uh, at multilateral, bilateral, and even internal level. So we, I have been trying to schematize a bit into different layers. The first one is the so-called multilateral bodies, uh, uh, which we are uh, working with much more focused on fisheries, obviously not only, but we uh, cooperate very much with the UN, uh, with FAO, uh, and in particular with the METU team. We as EU uh, participate in uh, several RFMOs, uh, and we are working very much, this was already mentioned by Ambassador Thompson in uh, with sub-regional bodies in terms of uh, uh, support together with other donors uh, uh, to the action in West Africa. And for instance, uh, the first acronyms are the Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission 
and the Fisheries Committee for Western and Central Gulf of Guinea. We are working very much with ASEAN also to try to support them uh, in developing the policy and instruments against IUU. And then we work very much with uh, what we can define as non-purely fisheries uh, partners, UNOEDC, ILO, Interpol, OECD. Why I'm, I'm mentioning all this? Not only because uh, all of us, we're trying to make a lot of effort and produce effort in supporting, uh, in particular, developing countries, but in particular because uh, they are uh, very much a precious uh, source uh, of uh, information and cooperation and information sharing go together in this fight against IUU. And I will come back to that when I will pick up the point on our work with the NGOs. Uh, the bilateral cooperation uh, we are developing uh, is, uh, let's say, the core business uh, of the uh, work of my team and of the European uh, Commission. And uh, our so-called IUU regulation, uh, we have uh, what you, Peter, uh, reminded in your introduction, the so-called IOU dialogues. I will come back to that later on, but this is a constant uh, cooperation we're having uh, with third countries. Uh, we have uh, a permanent uh, uh, work ongoing uh, with NGOs, uh, which are fundamental in this fight and fundamental for us. Uh, as I said, the information sharing here plays a, a basic role. And for us, uh, exchanging with NGOs, uh, uh, having the possibility to, pro to provide them with what we are doing and on their side, provide us uh, with a lot of information with their initiatives and ideas. It's certainly something uh, which uh, it's enriching our uh, capacity of action against the IUU. When I mention other stakeholders, uh, uh, these are uh, both institutional ones, because under the Common Fisheries Policy in the EU, we have the so-called advisory councils, where we have, again, NGOs, but also private sector, and also the private sector itself. Uh, we don't have a, a so regular uh, consultation with them, but certainly for us, uh, and I will come back later on on that, there are a fundamental player uh, in uh, supporting uh, the uh, world efforts in uh, fighting IUU. Uh, I have isolated uh, the uh, Operation Atalanta NAPFO because they're also a particular and precious source of information for us. And in terms of cooperation, they're absolutely helpful for us uh, in tackling uh, uh, IUU in the Southwest Indian Ocean. Uh, and this is just another example on how for us it's vital to have all this kind of information to strengthen our action. Uh, the last, very last bullet, it's not so much international cooperation, but I wanted to stress how much our action in the last 10 years, in particular under the IUU regulation, it's not only a European Commission action, but it's really a European action. All the institutions, they play a role uh, and they have been uh, uh, playing a fundamental part uh, in uh, the success of our regulation and of our action. We are backed uh, uh, very much at political level by the European Parliament, but obviously member states, in particular when it comes uh, to the uh, monitoring surveillance uh, of the products coming into our market, uh, uh, meaning the implementation and control of the uh, catch certification scheme, they are also playing a fundamental role. On top of this, we are working with them and with third countries with what we call in our system a mutual assistance system, which is a way to be simple to exchange real-time information uh, on uh, suspicious cases of IUU activities by a vessel or by uh, uh, countries when you can spot a laundering scheme, for instance, to introduce uh, illegally products in our market. So this is uh, uh, another part that I wanted to, to stress very much. Uh, we're not very skillful in promoting uh, a European uh, uh, success, but in this case, I have to say that the European Commission by itself uh, uh, would not be able uh, to be effective without uh, the other institutions. So coming to uh, the next slide and uh, now getting into uh, a bit more uh, the role of the European Union and our 
really day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, uh, as you can see, there are different actions uh, under our IUU bilateral cooperation, government to government, that we're implementing. Uh, the dialogues under the IUU regulation uh, are really uh, the uh, most important part of our work. So this regulation uh, has been uh, uh, conceived in 2010 uh, uh, exactly for another uh, point which was mentioned by Ambassador Thompson. Uh, actually, as a consumer, you don't want to eat illegal products. So the idea at the basis of this regulation was let's close the European Union market, which is the largest uh, market for fisheries products, to illegal products. This was the main uh, basis uh, and uh, objective of this regulation. During uh, the life of this regulation in this last 10 years, uh, I have to say that I've seen myself this regulation moving into a real cooperation instrument. Meaning then when we have these dialogues, what we do with third countries is to go talk to them, assess the fisheries management, see with them what are their shortcomings and supporting them in addressing these shortcomings. And this is something which is absolutely fundamental because of course, on, on one hand, we have our carding system, which is uh, uh, the instrument we use within this regulation if we get to critical situations of non-cooperation, but before getting to that very last resource of yellow, red card, we have a big room for maneuver with our partners. And I have to say we had in general, uh, on average, a very good response when we highlight shortcomings uh, to our partners. So we start working with them, we identify the shortcomings and we try to address this with them, starting from the legal framework till uh, the ratification of international instruments, monitoring, control and surveillance uh, tools uh, and traceability. Uh, the other uh, uh, elements I highlighted this uh, uh, here is uh, other actions that we have with bilateral partners. But what is absolutely fundamental is exchange of information. And we have been working with them to increase transparency. We push them to have the maximum transparency possible of the fishery system from a list of licenses to agreements that they have with other partners. And these are the concrete results that we uh, achieved. Uh, most of them, they've been able to upgrade their uh, fishery system. And PSMA, we have seen a lot of them ratifying uh, uh, for state measure agreement uh, uh, following our dialogues, scaling up the priorities of uh, their action uh, uh, at national level in fighting against IUU, becoming one of the first, and then developing more tools uh, uh, to cooperate with other, with other countries. Uh, very quickly, what I see as a, a future challenges, uh, as Matthew was saying, uh, what we have been experiencing, all what I've been saying, it's achievable only with political will. So political will is fundamental. We have to coordinate actions by market states. Market states can exercise a pressure when we, they act together. And I'm referring obviously to US and Japan. We have to have awareness uh, increasing uh, in industry and consumers. Industry, they are the closest one to the ground. They have to play a fundamental role. They don't have in particular buyers to buy illegal products. Uh, and uh, they, we have to uh, deploy a big effort for increasing transparency. We need to know uh, names of the vessels, where they are active, uh, where they are licensed. We need to know companies, owners, nationals uh, of different states involved in these companies. And this is another uh, point linked with one what we, that we see as uh, one of the other main challenges, which is flag of convenience, where people are uh, moving the vessels, uh, uh, states without uh, not so many possibilities of controlling them and being able uh, to exploit their loopholes. All this together, I hope, uh, will be able to contribute to reduce IO fishing in the, in, the, in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Roberta, and a very interesting uh, presentation there, talking about transparency. Again, uh, another theme like uh, Peter Thompson highlighted, the need for transparency and the need for dialogue and the, uh, the regional and sub-regional um, engagement, which is, uh, which, which is part of that. 
So thank you for that. And thank you very much to uh, the audience uh, because we're getting some quite interesting questions coming in, which I'm sure the panel are going to uh, relish, um, relish giving some answers to. Uh, but we'd now like to shift uh, slightly and uh, I'll be asking Bronwyn Golder to uh, come have a, a slightly different perspective. Um, this one looking at uh, how we can help foster the political will and how we can actually uh, improve coordination to deliver some of these. Bronwyn, thank you. Thank you, Peter, and kia ora koutou Greetings from Madrid. Um, thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, Stanford Centre for Ocean Solutions and partnership with the Friends of Ocean Action has a very strong focus on uh, IUU fishing and particularly on uh, implementation of the Port State Measures Agreement or PSMA aligned standards around the world, closing that gap uh, and taking a legal product off the plates of consumers around the world is, uh, is certainly something we're thinking about. I think what we've heard from, uh, from Matthew and Roberto uh, is clearly that we have multiple and, and very uh, effective international instruments, tools and regulations um, some of them have been in place for a very long time, others are re relatively new, but we're not wanting for uh, uh, global uh, minimum standards uh, and we're not wanting for ambition either in terms of uh, achieving the elimination of IUU. But the question that we have in 2020, uh, as we look at these instruments and as we look at some long-standing goals and targets is why aren't they being achieved? And We've come at it um, to look at, you know, how do we motivate and incentivize and accelerate implementation of the standards uh, and regulations that we do have. We don't need to create any more. Uh, we don't need to uh, multiply the number of fora that we have. Um, to discuss them. We just need to get on with doing them. We know what we are. How do we achieve that? Especially when we see, and I think these are some things that have been um, indicated before, but I just want to reiterate them. We see that there is a divergence of capacity and capability around the world between port states and um, in the developing world and the developed world. We know that there is a degree of kind of meeting and negotiation and regulatory fatigue. We hear it from the biggest port states and we hear it from the smallest Pacific nations. And now we're facing um, COVID-19 uh, and we're seeing potentially uh, the introduction or the, the renewal of risks that we saw prior to some of these instruments being um, developed and that is uh, critical I think as we look at this now. So we've looked at with our partners and mainly across Asia Pacific but how do we change our patterns of uh, collaboration? How do we generate the level of political will that I think all the speakers have spoken uh, that we need to achieve in order to really eliminate uh, IUU fishing? I think there's been some talk and pre-COVID there was a paper out about clubs, you know, how do we create clubs around particular ambitions or particular goals? And I think we've seen that um, across Asia Pacific, there are like-minded countries, both port and flag states, who will look and can voluntarily come together to commit to implementation of the measures and controls that we have agreed are needed, but as yet are not being implemented. They remain unratified or they remain um, under multilateral or, or regional um, regulation, but sometimes to a lower standard than an instrument like the PSMA sets out. These coalitions or subsets, if you like, of the global community need to have strong members that can support weaker or more vulnerable members, and they need to be prepared to implement controls to the standards that we have all agreed are needed to eliminate IUU. So what kind of examples? Well, last year, the, or the year before, I guess, because we skipped APEC last year, um, the APEC roadmap to combat IUU fishing was the beginning of a regional framework, not one that was there to replace RFMOs or indeed to uh, reject the PSMA, but to say as a regional grouping of economies, these countries would align around the introduction of port state measures standards that would look to address the gaps that are left by uneven 
or implementation of those same, same standards by RFMOs. Or we could be looking for regional groupings of states that agree on the elimination of subsidies for those engaged in IUU activities, even before the WTO comes to an agreement, because there is a collective agreement at the regional or sub-regional level that these are important. And critically, I think, as Roberto just uh, referenced in, in his presentation, the importance of the seafood industry as a grouping now more than ever committed to traceability. They can, they can set clear standards for the level of PSM implementation that, will, that they will require if their vessels are to unload or transship at ports. The collective and collaborative commitment of industry as advocates to governments around the Port State Measures Agreement, I think is something that holds real potential and certainly uh, port state measures uh, are a critical element in the seafood value chain and ensuring that that is addressed through the implementation of effective port state measures eliminates risk for industry. And as a sector, I think we're increasingly seeing their focus on that. So the amb ambition, if you like, is to see strong groupings, whether it's of governments or industry or both, on delivering these critical but as yet undelivered goals and ambitions of the instruments that we have. So they're essentially looking to fill the gaps that the current multitude of forums and agreements is leaving for the IUU fishing activity to slip through. I think the other thing that we have been looking at, or the important thing that we've been looking at, is the need for a clear bottom line from industry and government groupings, whether it's APEX or um, small island developing states or the seafood sector, that conservation measures, whether around transshipments or port state measures, observers, vessel identification, compliance, they need to be uniform across RFMOs. They need to be uniform around the world. That is the only way that we collectively and collaboratively, collaboratively achieve these, um, these minimum international standards. And if or when RFMOs or other groupings reject that call, I think industry can look to governments um, and, and, and indicate, if you will, that if they're not prepared to work to those standards, then their ports will not be receiving vessels. I think there is a point at which uh, the implementation, implementation of port state measures whether it's the PSMA or an aligned set of standards, has to become the minimum standard for the de delivery the, for the landing or the transshipment of catch at port. And industry can be incredibly critical in having that conversation with governments and ensuring by setting that own standard that that is where we go. I think there's also a similar um, conversation that can be had uh, around um, the transshipment or landing by vessels that are flying flags of convenience. Again, an issue that Roberto uh, referenced in his, um, in his presentation. So in summary, I think from our perspective, we have the instruments, we know what the minimum standards are. What we're looking for is how to bring together the key players the governments, the private sector, civil society consumers to say, actually, it's about time that we started to meet these minimal standards. And here through an entity like APEC or through a seafood sector association or through a grouping of like-minded countries, we can fill the gap that the large global uh, efforts have not managed to over recent years. Gracias. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bron. I think that you know you touched on uh, at the at the start there, touching on this changing the pattern of behaviour. One of the biggest uh, challenges, you know, it's very easy to put a treaty in place. Very easy, well, it's not easy to put a treaty in place, but you can get a treaty in place. You can change a process, but actually changing behaviours and also um, highlighting the the critical role of industry in 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 helping persuade government to do it and actually uh, showing a lead themselves on uh, on doing that so thank you very much and uh, now turn to you emily last but not least and if you'd just like to uh, give us your 
perspective from uh, from TNC, please. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I would just like to say thank you to Chatham House and Pew Charitable Trusts for inviting me to speak in today's panel on international cooperation. Um, so my name is Emily Langley. Um, the, I am the acting director for Ocean Policy at the Nature Conservancy. We are um, one of many NGOs working on this issue. Um, and I'm overseeing projects at the moment in Europe, in Japan, China, um, Latin America, and then we've got a couple of projects in uh, some Pacific Islands as well. So our team is literally spread across the world because this is such a, a global issue, which is why we are here today. So as we know, IU fishing has a detrimental effect on the environment and on the people who depend on these resources for food and income. And I wanted to start by saying that unless all governments ratify and emphasis on implement international agreements on sustainable fishing and fisher safety, as well as adhere to regional conservation and management measures and update their own national laws, illegal operators will continue to find and exploit weak, weak points. They will find those flags, those ports and those markets of convenience. And in light of that, TNC, we're part of um, the EU IUU coalition, which is the coalition of NGOs operating in Europe on this issue. And last year, we actually published 30 criteria for improving transparency and achieving good governance in fisheries. It is essentially a checklist and we urge governments to, with any involvement in the fishing sector, to um, review their policies and enforcement measures, whether you're a flag, a coastal, a port, a processing or a, or a market state. So we've heard a bit today already that IU fishing is also found to be associated with many other forms of transnational organized crime, such as human trafficking, modern slavery, drug trafficking, and also those economic crime types. So the large scale tax fraud and money laundering. Therefore, this issue does require collaboration across jurisdiction and not just between governments, but between businesses, industry, um, NGOs, insurance providers, enforcement agencies, etc. The list goes on. And at TNC, because we are working across geographies and with many different sectors, for example, in Europe, we work closely with uh, Roberto Cesare's team in the European Commission, but also with the catching sector and other actors in the seafood supply chain. And as an NGO, because we have this regional and global picture, we can observe and research best practices for combating IU fishing. And we can take these best practices and lessons learned to other countries. An example is the Port State Measures Agreement, which we've already had a lot about today from the other panelists. And we're carrying out research to show the legal changes, the administrative reforms and the capacity building that countries have undertaken in order to implement the Port State Measures Agreement. And we use these case studies to talk with other governments who might be hesitant for some reason or another to implement it in the same way. And I wanted to mention with the Port State Measures Agreement, at the heart of it is this cooperation between the fishing port and the flag state. So information exchange is essential. And I know we'll have the global information exchange system by the FAO, which uh, Peter Thompson mentioned, which helps with the requirements of Article 16. But for Articles 9 and 12 of this agreement, and those are around um, obtaining information around vessels requesting entry into port, there needs to be that greater communication between the port and the flag states. And at the moment, this seems to be hampering uh, some of the implementation. Another um, anti-IUU measure I wanted to focus on in the context of international cooperation is import control schemes. Uh, for example, catch documentation schemes that um, Roberto Cesare, you mentioned this. Um, and these are market state measures to understand the origin of imported seafood. They're essentially a passport that follows the fish from the moment of catch to the dinner plate. Then it allows consumers to know and feel confident that the fish they bought has been sustainably fished, landed, processed and exported. And the EUIU coalition, we analyzed basically existing import control schemes of the largest seafood importing states. So that would be the EU, US and Japan. And the EU has its own catch documentation scheme, which covers all species with some minor exemptions, whereas the US system covers 13 species identified as most vulnerable to IU fishing. Japan is actually in the process of developing its own system and lots of NGOs, including TNC, were helping 
uh, the Japanese government, the fishing sector um, on this. But what was really interesting was when we compared the EU and the US uh, systems, they don't ask for the same information. We call them key data elements at the point of import. And in the coming years, we expect more countries to adopt their own import control rules. And something that we're kind of pushing for is uh, this better alignment between the systems, which would help information exchange between the governments and facilitate trade. And um, also from an industry perspective in the future, the cost of complying with multiple systems could be quite considerable. So um, that was a, a piece of research that you can also, it's available on our website on iuwatch.eu. Um, coming on to my last point, which uh, about deep sea fisheries in the high seas. And these have a unique management challenge because they take place in international waters that are outside the control of any one state. These are the high seas, they cover 64% of the ocean surface. Um, and at the moment, the legal governance framework of the high seas is based on UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, along with a few other agreements. And RFMOs at the moment have a mandate to manage certain fish stocks in the high seas. Um, but they don't have uh, the competency or the, the mandate to cover all ocean management needs. The RFMOs are purely focused on those specific fish stocks. So there really needs to be another complementary system. And that's why the UN is currently negotiating a new treaty to promote the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in these areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and the objective of this agreement is not to replace the RFMOs, but rather to support, complement and enhance the effect effectiveness of their work to ensure sustainability and ecosystem health. Um, so this is a really current example of international cooperation or rather negotiation at this stage to ensure that this kind of wild west of the ocean is managed correctly. Um, and an update on that, governments were due to meet in March for the final scheduled negotiations, but because of um, the COVID-19 situation, these have been temporarily postponed, um, but it's important to continue the work and the momentum in order to finalize this negotiation and adopt this landmark treaty as soon as possible. So those are my points and thank you very much for listening and um, thank you once again to Chatham House and to Pew and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. And um, uh, very interesting again, talking about uh, transnational organized crime and notice the theme there as well with uh, Bronze Point about this need for commonality and alignment and um, the way the way that um, the NGOs in particular are sort of looking for that so they can provide the, uh, the, the best uh, the best advice. And also, I think, um, highlighting that last point, which is also very important, this one on the high seas and the challenges of not starting with a blank uh, piece of paper, because there's lots of uh, international instruments already out there and you kind of know what needs to be done, but it's uh, but it's difficult. Now, this is where I was uh, hoping to ask all, all my uh, clever questions, um, but unfortunately, the uh, the audience have uh, started asking some more interesting ones. Um, and uh, so, if you will, um, forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize a, a couple of them uh, and we'll, we'll go through it that way. Some of the questions will not uh, get addressed today. So for example, uh, a couple of people have asked uh, questions about subsidies. There's a subsidies panel uh, occurring on Wednesday. Uh, so later on this week, so please, um, you know, join that panel, ask the question. I'm sure that Ruth and Anna will, uh, will make sure it, uh, it, it, it carries across. Now, panel, um, the first big uh, challenge that, is, uh, that, that has come in, uh, a number of uh, people watching have you know, noted your comments about the need for uh, coordination, cooperation across the piece. And they have twofold question, which is one, how do you, when you're talking to a, a, a state or an area, um, deconflict because there's lots of people with lots of good ideas, lots of initiatives, and how are those coordinated, or are those coordinated uh, at, at, at the moment? And then there's a, a second part of that question where a couple of the people want to know whether you think that the capacity building is best provided by states or by NGOs. 
So it's quite a complicated question, but I'm sure that uh, all of you will have uh, lots of thoughts on that. Now, I just look for a, uh, a hand up to see who wants to uh, have a go at that first. Uh, failing all else, I'll, I'll lurk somebody. Matthew, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Pete, and thank you to all for sending in all these uh, pertinent questions. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll just like to, to start by referring to this um, uh, aspect of interagency coordination. Many times we find that uh, there is, and I referred to this in my, in my presentation earlier, lack of coordination between the different agencies. There may be processes in place to um, to regulate cargo ships coming into a port, for example, and then there may be port state measures that are trying to be implemented by fishery, and then of course there are the, the procedures for customs and the, the procedures for um, nowadays even more relevant um, health uh, health checks, security check, etc. And most of the time we find that the problem is not that the processes are not in place, but they are not put in place together. They are not um, part of the same flow. So one process is undermining another one. Uh, and they don't talk to each other and they don't pass on information to each other. And therefore there is need um, worldwide to have more um, interagency coordination in implementing the processes for their respective objectives. Now, at inter this has to be reflected also at international level to support this, uh, this idea, this approach at national level. And we're trying to do that very much so with especially the IMO and the ILO, for which we have a joint working group, FAO, IMO, ILO working group on IU fishing and related matters. And we're trying to strengthen that um, our programs together so that we can support countries in developing these interagency coordination mechanisms. On the capacity development um, aspects, well, uh, whether it's states or NGOs or anybody better place to deliver that my answer is all together but in a concerted action in a concerted way many times we go in to a country to try to deliver a training program and two weeks before there was the similar training program delivered by somebody else so not only is there inefficiency and waste of resources but perhaps um you know the the, the net result is not going to be achieved and what we are trying to say is also that we need to um, build a plan. Capacity development is not about delivering a training course or just uh, reviewing legislation or, or just putting in uh, new technology for, for MCS. It needs to be all together, the legislation, the institution setup and capacity and the MCS and operations part need to be built together and um, and relevant to each other. Otherwise, if it is just ad hoc um, capacity development given by different entities, then the, the, the effect is not going to have um, any, there's not going to be any effect and capacity development will, it will be creating more confusion than rather than increasing the capacity within the country. Thank you. Roberto, could I ask you to uh, reflect on that please as, as well? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I wanted actually to build up on what Matthew said on the interagency cooperation uh, within states. This is a fundamental point. Uh, we have uh, been always, or almost always, confronted with this uh, issue at the level of our dialogues with third countries. In particular, and this is also linked with one uh, uh, point that I mentioned as a future challenge in my last slide, to the issue of flag of convenience. And I'm trying to explain myself. What sometime uh, we have found very lacking in uh, administration of third countries, uh, and in particular uh, developing states, but not only, uh, it's the coordination and common work between the maritime or transport authorities who have the authority of registered vessels and the fisheries authorities. So sometime, in particular, uh, if we're talking about uh, countries with very important fishing registry, the relative importance of the fisheries authorities in those countries is very, very minor. And they've always been neglected. 
So when we enter into this dialogue as EU, uh, we saw the effect of, first of all, scaling up the importance, the relative importance of fishery authorities within a general administration of a country. And obviously, we always uh, been highlighting uh, to the maritime authorities that this interagency cooperation is fundamental and that the fisheries authorities add at the fundamental role of monitoring what is happening with the registration of fisheries and fisheries related vessels. This is fundamental because if fisheries authorities are not on top of the registration of these vessels, you create loopholes and weaknesses that obviously unscrupulous operators are absolutely looking for. It's not only the, 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 it's not the only reason for the so-called flag of convenience environment, but it's one of the main reasons if we look at fisheries compliance. Then in terms of capacity building, I agree with Matthew. I think there was this very important initiative of this portal uh, at FAO level where uh, the different uh, projects of capacity building uh, should have been listed and will be listed because coordination uh, in this case, it's really fundamental to avoid to do the same things uh, in the same country twice or, or even three times. Uh, we have been working trying to uh, increase this with Matthew and team, his team, but also with World Bank and with all other donors. We need to have a concrete uh, coordination in place and work together with focused and targeted objectives. Thank you very much, Roberto. And uh, Emily and Bronner, look to you, and I'll start off with you, Emily, on, on this, this point about the coordination, because there's two elements of that coordination, I think, from the NGO perspective. There's that one which is coordinating with uh, institutions such as the FAO and uh, the EU, but also coordination with, uh, with other NGOs. Yes, exactly. That was the point I was, I was about to make, actually. We... Um... TNC, we, we always work in coalition, so um, as well as other NGOs working on this topic. So the EU-IU coalition is a coalition of NGOs. We have a similar coalition in Japan and in China for that purpose, that we do not want to duplicate um, work. And we also want to put across a stronger message, um, you know, show a united front on this issue. Um, and just to echo what Roberto said about um, the interagency uh, collaboration. We often find that um, when, when we're working in country that it takes quite a bit of effort to bring the relevant agencies around the table and that could be simply the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Fisheries um, and that's usually our starting point to get these actors around the table to talk about this issue and say this is impacting all of you and you all need to have a, have a um, seat at the table. Thank you. And Bron, your uh, your take on this, uh, in particular, obviously looking at as you do in the uh, in the Pacific region. Uh, anything, any insight that you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the process of collaboration comes down to what you are convening around. What are you collaborating to achieve? And I think the important thing for us looking at the Asia Pacific region is that the Port State Measures Agreement provides very clear standards, very clear controls and ambitions that all parties, given the political will, can convene around in whatever configuration is appropriate to a particular place in a particular time. I think NGOs over, the, over recent decades have got a lot better at working with industry in terms of aligning our efforts and our resources around shared goals and shared objectives. I think when it comes to the Port State Measures Agreement, you know, we share the objectives of the FAO, of the FFA in the Pacific, of the RFMOs, even though we'd like to kind of lever them a few steps higher in terms of the standards that they, they are looking to achieve. But I think really, you know, keeping our eye, as Matthew said at the very beginning, on that international set of agreed standards around port state measures, we can convene in whatever way is most appropriate and most effective to implement them. Thank you. Um, that was uh, hopefully answered the question, certainly uh, good, good answers from my perspective. Matthew, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot because we've got a, a question from uh, Catherine Patterson, who has asked, what is the status of the FAO counter IUUF capacity building portal that was presented at the last PSMA ad hoc working group? Uh, yes. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, in fact, um, when I stopped answering the question, I re remember that I forgot to mention this portal, but uh, Roberto came to my rescue and he did mention it. Yes, um, this is a, an initiative that um, we are developing through our global program. Um, it's in fact supported by the European Union project. And the idea is to have this um, live database on all the capacity development work, all the projects, all the initiatives that are taking place around the world by country, by donor, by... So this is going to be open. We're going to be inviting the international community, whether they are academic institutions, states, NGOs, IGOs, to register their capacity development program or projects uh, with some details in a standardized way and this would be made available publicly and it would be a and, and one would then it would it would benefit first of all the, the the developing countries to know what opportunities there are for getting some technical assistance it will be beneficial also to donors to make sure that they know that they are investing in projects that uh, they're not duplicating effort and wasting money um, and uh, be able to direct their funding to where it is really needed. Um, and also for, for us, the implementers, uh, to be able to coordinate and to make sure that we are delivering to the country what is required in the best way possible. Um, so this portal, now to come to the, to the, to the to the point, to the answer, it is uh, in an advanced state of development. Uh, we should be able to release this um, within this year. Uh, it has taken some time. There have been some uh, constraints, but we have been working on it and we will be uh, delivering this soon. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, the next question is uh, directed uh, it was, was directed at Roberto, but I'd also be very interested in uh, Bron's take on this. And this is a, a question from Alejandro Anganuzzi, and I apologize if I mispronounced. It's, uh, how do you see the collaboration across sectors to create a structure of market incentives and disincentives that would support changes in behavior and generate the political will to enhance the implementation of regulations? Thanks to, Ale to Alejandro, no, an old friend. Uh, well, uh, from our perspective, we are working very much, as I said, uh, uh, government to government. Huh? But uh, as I also said, for me, the intersectoral cooperation in this fight, uh, it's uh, a must. You cannot like win this fight, even if you have the most perfect instrument in terms of catch certification, traceability, protection of your market, which is one of the main uh, strength here to drive the efforts, uh, in particular of exporting countries, of course, you need to have a cooperation between the different players and actors. And I think uh, uh, it has been said by the other colleagues, uh, it's not only institutions or public uh, uh, institutions uh, uh, which should be in the first line. Why? Because they will never be on the very, very first line. And I'm explaining myself coming to the private sector. Those who are on the grounds, they are those who have the closest knowledge to reality. And certainly they know things before we in Brussels or in this city or uh, in Wellington or wherever, we are going to know how the things are happening at sea and on the ground. So they have to step up. They have to step up. And when I, I say step up, for instance, uh, to give a practical uh, uh, example, the buyers, the processing uh, industry, they, for instance, should start thinking of buying products only from vessels which have an IMO number. So why don't they limit their supplies from vessels that are identifiable? This would be an absolute uh, push 
to the overall fight against IUU. Then, of course, we have to do what we need to do at the institutional level, cooperation, IUU regulation, catch certification. But at the end of the day, we need this intersectorial uh, 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 cooperation or we're never gonna win this fight. Thank you, Roberto. Ron. I think what we've found uh, in our dialogue with the private sector, and we've been dealing with the top five or six um, seafood sector associations, uh, principally in the Asia Pacific region, around tuna, but more broadly, um, is that we need to share incentives. <laughs> we need to have shared incentives. Um, so in talking to industry, it's very clear that uh, traceability and the ability to um, achieve traceability across the value chain is very, very important, increasingly important in terms of, of their market and their consumers. Um, ensuring that uh, IUU catch is not entering that chain is therefore critically important. Uh, the implementation of effective port state measures is therefore critically important. And the dialogue we've had with them is how do they become advocates to gov governments? How do we bring, uh, how do we incentivize uh, the seafood sector to engage in, in positive advocacy to governments to say, you know, this is what we want to see being done at your port. So if our vessels are going to come and land their catch there, same thing to flag states. This is what we, we want to see your vessels on the global record. We want to see your vessels sharing data if we're going to purchase catch from them. So we need to incentivize. And similarly, we need to be saying to governments, you know, the economics of, of fisheries is critically important to a lot of the um, Pacific Island developing states, critically important, more than half their GDP. They need to know that the investment that they make in building capability and building capacity to deliver port state measures is going to be rewarded by a seafood sector that then brings their catch to their port. And so there needs to be a shared model of incentivization, which NGOs and um, UN agencies and the EU and others can support. We can all bring ourselves around to support the sector and the governments. But we need to be very clear, the standards exist. We just need to see them brought into reality. Yeah, I, th I think one of the, uh, it, it's an interesting challenge, I think, with the in incentivization piece particularly as we uh, head towards a, a global recession and just the degree in the uh, how, how to pull those how, how to pull those levers but now shifting target slightly and uh, this question is primarily uh, directed at uh, Emily and Matthew and it it was talking about the need for uh, information exchange particularly between regional uh, fisheries management organizations and bodies and how in many respects, the, uh, the, the BBNJ treaty, which uh, Emily touched on, uh, could provide a, a really positive opportunity to, uh, to strengthen that. And the audience would like to know the degree to which uh, you think that that opportunity is being grasped and your thoughts on uh, where it's going to go. So I will start off with you, Emily, uh, first, and then Matthew, please. Yeah, it's a, re a really good question. Um... I think when it comes to the BBNJ negotiation process, there are a couple of sticking points. Um, so obviously this treaty isn't just focused on fisheries. Um, it's there to protect other, to protect the ocean from other activities occurring on the high seas. Um, so with the fisheries aspect, what's tricky about negotiating this treaty is that we obviously do have some management in place. We've got the RFMOs managing, I think 5% of the fish stocks in the high seas. I saw a paper recently. Um, so I think that the, the governments that are negotiating this treaty are conscious that they don't want to undermine uh, the, the existing work of the RFMOs. They want this treaty to um, complement and, and fill existing gaps. So um, that's what I would say say on, on that point. Um, I, I also wanted to mention as well, when it comes to the BBNJ process, um, the, what's great is that out of this treaty, we will be able to establish um, effective marine protective, protected areas in the high seas. And obviously these 
this link to IUU fishing is that MPAs will help to strengthen ecosystems um, that are already being challenged by other activities such as IUU fishing. So I, I, want to, I meant to make that point actually earlier in my presentation that um, that's another link between the BBNJ process and, and IUU fishing. Thank you. Matthew. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think I'll uh, focus more on the uh, the importance of, of information exchange in all of this. Well, it, it is important for us to know the identity of the vessel, the true identity of the vessel. And this comes with some processes that have already been put in place, including um, the IMO number, for example. Uh, we need to know about the operations uh, of the vessel, you know, the licenses that are uh, active at that very moment on that particular vessel, where it has been uh, fishing, where it has been operating, where it has been transshipping, whatever. And we also need to know about the compliance of that vessel. So if you build up this picture for every vessel that is out there fishing, then every time there is an inspection, there is um, a landing, there's information that is collected through technology and placed into one place, um, then this is going to be more informative. It's, it's exponential. You know, the, the information is going to continue to be put there on record. And every time that vessel comes into a port, for example, the inspector there is going to be in a better situation because there's going to be more information about that vessel from the last time that vessel has um, uh, has entered the port. Um, and it, the information is, is endless. Um, you know, mentioning the BBNJ, eventually, you know, the compliance, not only with the fisheries, uh, strict fisheries regulations, but also other uh, ocean related uh, regulations, including the safety of the vessel. So why not? Yes, let's have the safety records of that vessel and the, the safety checks that IMO are, are keeping. The, the records of um, from, from the labor aspect, the working conditions, how they're being inspected, the health and hygiene. So the more that this comes together, the, in a timely manner, in an efficient manner, in one place, that's better. And this is what I was saying earlier on. It's not that we're starting from scratch. There's a lot of information out there collected by countries, corrected at regional level, at sub-regional level, but somehow we need to make the next step in bringing all this information to a global level. Why? Because fishing vessels move from one area of the world to another. Um, so the more that we, we are informed, the better placed we are to be able to combat IUU fishing and to detect it. Thank you, very much. Time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Roberto, you'll be very surprised to hear that there's been a couple of questions about the EU IUU regulation. And, um, <laughs> to, if, if I could just group, uh, group them into three, uh, three particular areas. And um, one is, uh, the, the first part is, how do you ensure that the um, the most deserving get the formal dialogues and the and, and the cards in the first instance. Um, the second part is moving ahead. Uh, are there any plans to reassess how the, those formal dialogues are uh, initiated? And are you going to be including elements such as uh, human rights and uh, organized crime in there? And then the final part is monitoring of uh countries post carding so basically it's the it, it, it it's it's the process so i'd ask you to uh answer that and then emily um because i know that i uh, you watch uh keeps keeps an eye on all of that i'd like you as well to give from an ngo perspective afterwards please Roberto. yeah thanks very much trying to be brief and uh, to reply to the three questions uh well how we ensure that the most deserving ones receive this card the IUU regulation is not an instrument to, to give cards left and right. This was not like uh, the, the uh, objective uh, uh, that was behind the conception of this regulation. As I said at the beginning in my presentation, this has been mostly conceived as an instrument of cooperation. Now, how we identify the countries uh, we start our dialogues with, we have a, a risk assessment methodology. We are in dialogues, formal or not formal. Formal when you have a card. 
informal when you don't have a card, but we are in discussion with many, many countries without having issued any cards on IUU. Uh, well, we have a series of indicators there. Uh, take into account, Peter, that I have also uh, nine uh, staff members in my unit. <laughs> so the HR is also a factor. But certainly we have a, a, a series of information provided by NGOs, by Interpol, by NAP for all the uh, actors that I've been trying to list in my presentation. Uh, and there we can be able to assess if there is a risk for us to be in a situation of importing illegal products from that particular country, or if that country is contributing, for instance, those flags of convenience ones, to the uh, increase of the IUU phenomena as such. This is uh, uh, the first re response that I can, I can provide, but I repeat, the cards are the very last resort of this action. Mainly what we want is to cooperate to enhance the standards of our third country partners, not like to assess their behavior and give red and yellow, left and right uh, as uh, referees, uh, because we're not referees. Eh? <laughs> we're just trying to, to improve cooperation worldwide. Uh, reassess the IU regulation uh, uh, in general terms, not for the moment, but uh, maybe someone knows that some, of, some parts of this regulation are now currently under revision in the framework of the revision of the EU IUU control regulations. In particular, uh, uh, maybe this is uh, known to the experts, but not to everyone. We have been working uh, in the last two years to move our catch uh, certificate, which is paper-based, uh, to the digitalized uh, uh, format, so to have an IT uh, catch certification system uh, and not a paper one. Uh, we are working uh, in uh, modifying the IU regulation by introducing, through the modification of the control regulation, I'm sorry, it's a bit complex, but this is <laughs> the union, uh, the um, obligation for member states and our operators to use uh, the IT uh, catch system, meaning the digitalized version. On the other hand, we're also working uh, to streamline uh, and harmonize uh, the sanctioning system within the control regulation. Now it's split our sanctioning system internally. There is a part in the IUU regulation and a part in the old control regulation, but these for the moment are the two parts we're working on and there is no like uh, really a, an appetite to expand uh, our, uh, our regulation to other uh, elements that are not fisheries compliance because it's a fisheries regulation. This is something that I've been repeating and repeating to NGOs. We're not dealing with social issues. We're not dealing with labor issues. We are dealing indirectly with labor and social issues. If you have a good system of monitoring and control, then you have some effects also on other uh, elements uh, of, of crime. Uh, monitoring a postcard, and this is what we're doing. Uh, possibly the, the colleagues and the, those who are attending this uh, uh, webinar knows that for the first time uh, we have been issuing uh, uh, a second uh, uh, yellow card to a country which went through a yellow card between 2014 and 2016, just in December last year. And this is because we are trying uh, as much as we can with our resources to monitor those who went through this carding system, maybe with a red or a yellow and got back to the green, but keeping an eye on them. And when we have information that something risky is going on, then we restart the dialogue. And there is always a possibility to get back to the previous situation as the, the last decision of the European Commission of December last uh, shows. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Emily, anything you would like to say from IEU? Yes, just a few more points. Um, so firstly, um, regarding the, the European Commission's decisions on carding, uh, the EU-IU coalition, we, we obviously have eyes in different places and um, we're able to supply information and we have a good partnership with the European Commission and we can provide intelligence on what's happening in in different parts of the world. So that was one point that I wanted to make, um, that cooperation between the NGOs and, and government. Um, the second point is that we know that, uh, for example, Roberta Cesare's team, nine people. So um, 
the the NGOs also have our, we have our own dialogues as well with countries to try and um, maintain conversations, especially where a country has been uh, decarded, it's had the card rescinded. Uh, we make sure we keep up uh, uh, a good dialogue with countries to see how they are getting on. And then the third point was around um, the EU IU regulation and and um, the the NGOs really support this regulation. We 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 really back it, um, and we know that elements are being reviewed through the revision of the control regulation, particularly around the catch certificate. And we propose some some amendments to the catch certificate. For example, we want to have um, a better distinction when it comes to catch area between the high seas and and uh, the EEZ. Um, but um, but yeah, as a whole, with the EU IU regulation, it's very much supported by by the NGOs. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'm sorry that we're uh, we're rushing on, uh, and this will be the uh, the, the last um, form, formal uh, question before I uh, come back to the panelists. And uh, Bron, I think it's one that you're probably best uh, placed to give a perspective on. And it's um, summarising a number of questions which have been uh, brought in about the the COVID nineteen. Uh, pandemic and the impact that will have on the ability to um, carry the message of countering IEU fishing to political leaders and economics ministers uh, as they're facing the recession and how you see that or do you see that needing to uh, needing to be changed? Well, well I think you know the in some ways, um, COVID-19 provides an opportunity to focus the conversation um, around IUU fishing across the Pacific um, as a region. I think, you know, we've clearly seen changes in um, fleet activity, in, in inten intensity, how intensively they've been fishing, um, and in how they've been operating with regard to transshipments or port visits. I think one of the things that has been uh, highlighted in the Pacific is that there has been an uneven implement implementation of uh, port closures across the region, which has left um, a lot of vessels uh, uncertain about where to go um, or how to operate. So there hasn't been a regional response, which I think has left some of the, um, the states thinking about maybe there needs to be one in the future. Um, and also what are the implications in terms of risk of uh, the relaxation of the regulations by the RFMOs around observers and transshipments? So, you know, we now have, I think, um, a greater range uh, of, of a greater diversity, if you like, of port and vessel behaviours across the region. Um, and that perhaps can incentivize a question about what a standardization might look like. Uh, and what is the reward of that? What is the reward for the port that is still looking to provide inspections or is still looking to um, undertake the risk assessment when they get a request for port in entry compared with what happens to the port that is now saying, well, we're sort of closed, but actually if you transship outside of the port in waters that are more dangerous without an observer on board, that's okay too, as long as you pay us for your vessel day. So, you know, it's kind of opened us up again to some potentially bad, um, bad activity, but that has created an opportunity, I think, for leaders across the region and whether it's through SIDS or whether it's through, um, you know, the PNA agreement or whether it's through APEC to actually say, in this instance, where we start to face greater risk, both as flag and port states, how do we convene around the best standards? We know what they are, they're out there. How do we convene around those and look to in implement them in, a, in an accelerated way so that we don't get the kind of divergence that we're currently seeing and frankly, the risk that we're currently seeing um, to the operation of fisheries across the region. And I think that does also bring in issues around health and safety, around work, workers' rights, uh, and the whole impact that this has had on observers, 
uh, and inspections and port operations uh, has got to be something that we turn around to deliver you know, positive forward thinking outcomes rather than a reversion back to you know, the bad old days. Thank you very much indeed. Now, before um, I uh, do a quick uh, summary, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to spend no more than one minute, uh, please, giving any uh, last uh, comments or observations that they would like. And I uh, would do that in the reverse order to the, which, uh, to the order in which we spoke. So uh, Emily, I'll be looking to you to start off, then Bronwyn, then Roberto, and finishing with you, Matthew. Emily. Yes, uh, I just wanted to reiterate the point that um, all governments need to adopt um, and uh, enforce these international agreements on sustainable fishing and fisher safety, adhere to the regional uh, management um, measures and update their national laws um, in order to stop illegal operators seeking out these weak points. Um, and then in light of the current situation with COVID-19 and um, you know, concerns about illegal operators capitalizing on maybe reduced staffing and lower resources in governments, I think the conversation can turn to um, low cost alternatives for monitoring control and surveillance um, in order to keep up our efforts in light of the, the current global crisis. Thank you very much. Emily, Ron. Um, I'd say that, and I'll focus specifically on the Port State Measures Agreement. We have a good instrument. Um, it provides uh, good standards for good controls. Um, and we need to be looking at how to convene all stakeholders around uh, its implementation. We need to look to our FMOs and hold them to account so that we get a uniformity in terms of adherence to those standards. It's not enough for um, a flag state to adhere to one standard with a one RFMO, but then to seek to have a lower standard in other areas. I think uh, we collectively uh, need to move towards um, greater uniformity. And I think we need to look at rewarding best practice through support for building capability and capacity. We need to support um, the developing states who are, look, who are putting in the hard work uh, to implement port state measures. And we need to look to the private sector to provide some of that reward in terms of doing business with those states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roberto. Yeah, I would say keep this uh, fight against the EU in terms of multilateral uh, and international cooperation very high on the agenda. And events like this one contribute to this, because even if all of us were working on this since several years, we don't have to relax. This should be kept high on the agenda. We have been managing finally in the last years to have IUU mentioned in the conclusions of the G20, of the G7, in all the biggest uh, 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 meetings uh, uh, and gathering of leaders in the world. We need to keep this high. Only like this, all the countries and governments will realize that this is their duty. It's an SDG goal. They have to work on that. Obviously, developed countries need to support developing countries in achieving these objectives. Thank you very much, Roberto. Matthew. Thank you, Peter. Um, I can't agree more with what Roberto has just said. And um, I think the final message is that you know, countries cannot act alone, no matter how well, um, how much capacity they've got to combat IU fishing, they need others, they need their neighbors, uh, they need cooperation at regional level, they need cooperation at international, global level. And the instruments are there, the mechanisms are there, it's just trying to maximize the benefits of what we have in place. Uh, and therefore, this is why uh, we are very pleased to see uh, that international cooperation has opened this series of uh, webinars for this week. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of uh, the hundreds of people who have uh, 
signed in to this. Thank you all the panelists for uh, a very interesting series of presentations and great answers to uh, to the questions that were posed and also to um, Ruth and Anna from Chatham House who behind the scenes have been making this all uh, making this all happen. From my perspective, as I was sort of listening to the um, listening to the answers and also in orchestrating um, this this first session, I got the feeling that you know combating IEU fishing is very much a team sport, and um, there's lots of different parts of that team, and no one individual, however brilliant they are, however good that le legislation or that country is on its own, it will never actually make that difference. And I was also struck by Peter Thompson highlighting the fact that we all have a role in this. And, you know, we've seen with the current crisis that when people are all alive to doing something and actually taking charge and taking an interest, you can move forward. The five themes, which I think were uh, really uh, hammered home from the, from the presentations, we're, we're not starting from a blank sheet. There's already a reasonable infrastructure in place there. That's got both benefits and challenges. So you've got the, the, the slight risk with the BBNJ going through. The fact that international cooperation is both global and regional and sub-regional. And we need to bear that in mind. It's not just a one size fits all. And that once you've got the international instruments in place, you need to actually implement them effectively down at the regional and sub-regional level. The other thing is to do that, we've got to improve on our transparency and trust. And this information uh, exchange and the information sharing, which all of the speakers highlighted. And we reflect that, you know, performance to date has been patchy. We've actually missed the SDG target, uh, which is um, a shame. However, we have got most of the tools in place. And if we keep this on the agenda, certainly from what I've been uh, was listening and hearing from the speakers, we can actually continue to push towards this goal of reducing IEU fishing until it's actually no longer a significant challenge for the world. Thank you very much indeed, panelists. And Anna, I would like to uh, hand over to you now for uh, summarizing, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'm a research analyst at Chatham House uh, with a focus on oceans. Uh, and I have been I have been in touch with many of you when organizing this conference, and uh, I'm really delighted to see such strong participation in today's meeting. So, on behalf of Chatham House, uh, I would just like to say a big thank you to the excellent speakers, to the fantastic chair, uh, to the UN Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Ocean. And to all of you who have joined this webinar or followed the event by the Chatham House website. And this forum, it will continue all week. Uh, tomorrow, the discussions will be focusing on how IEU fishing impacts women and gender relations and what a gender sensitive uh, response to IEU fishing might look like. And uh, the session will start at 2 p.m., so please join that. Later in, the weeks, uh, later in the week, the discussions will focus on the interplay between subsidies and IEU fishing. Uh, the role of new technologies and how transparency can be enhanced. And we will also host a specific session focusing on IU fishing in Southeast Asia. And we encourage you to join these sessions. We really value your input. And it's been, as I said, it's been fantastic seeing how many that uh, joined today. So thanks again for participating and we hope to see you tomorrow.